grandma has this dress. No, neither. I feel like Harry Potter. Too librarian. Too Bono? No. 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 Big no. Yes. I look a little bit like a bumblebee. How long you been in these parts? Bleh. If sadness had a color. I bought this? Your Honor, I object. Hmm? No. This is so much like my dad. That is the ticket.
Support for KQED Live comes from Berkeley Rep. Support for KQED comes from the Asian Art Museum. Visitors can step into an experience like no other at Team Lab Continuity. And become part of a wondrous ecosystem of lush natural imagery that dynamically evolves around them. For more information and ticket reservations, visit asianart.org. The disproportionate impact of more COVID than half of black business owners. And disproportionate. Somehow we always find a way Welcome to rise. To the blueprint builders, to the backbones of every block, for the curators of the culture, and for generations to follow. You might fall, but never fail. Keep rising. Keep rising. Keep rising. Apply for business, marketing, and tech makeovers on us. So glad I'm flying out of Oakland today. Let's count the reasons why. For one, flying locally reduces my carbon footprint. Plus, my airport supports over 17,000 jobs in the East Bay. And it makes sense. The more I fly from OAK, the more flights airlines will add out of OAK. All good. No matter where you live in the Bay Area, there are many great reasons to pick OAK and fly the East Bay way. What you do with that extra hour is up to you. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Michael Issip. I'm president and CEO of KQED. And welcome to KQED Live here in the space we call the Commons, nested in our headquarters in San Francisco's Mission District. Now, KQED Live, as you know, because you're here, is our new live event series, in person and virtual. But KQED Live is more than just an event series. These are experiences. Experiences meant to bring our journalism, our journalists, our programming to life, to spark bold civic dialogue, as well as to amplify our cultural vitality. Now, KQD's mission, our purpose, is to serve the Bay Area, serve the Bay Area with trusted journalism and quality programming, journalism and programming that informs, inspires, and involves. Informs based on facts, accuracy, and truth. Inspires with stories about human experiences, stories that we hope move you intellectually and emotionally, and inspires or involves by bringing people together like this evening so we can come together and participate as active and responsible citizens. Now, we believe we're an essential service, but the most important thing I can say this evening is thank you because just as you depend on us, we absolutely rely on you. So thank you for however you support KQED, attending events like these, watching, listening, going to our website, downloading our app, and especially if you are a member. You have made, and I say this humbly, you've made KQED one of the most watched, most listened to public media organizations in the country. We are the number one news and information radio station in the Bay Area. And by the way, out of all news and information stations in the country, we're in the top five. And in all, about one in two Bay Area adults use at least one KQED service a week. And we have more than 257,000 members. So thank you for your support. And speaking of support, I want to acknowledge and thank our partners, our sponsors for KQED Live. You saw their messages, Asian Art, Museum, Berkeley Rep, Comcast Business, and Oakland International Airport. Now, this evening, I guarantee you, you will be informed. And my hope is that you will be inspired, inspired to be involved in the conversation and perhaps carry it forward past this evening. As you know, we're going to explore the case for reparations for black people in California. This is part of an ongoing reporting initiative called Reparations in California. And currently, there's a state task force that is exploring the issues. And they're expected to release a proposal to address the legacies of slavery 
as well as systemic racism. You are in great hands this evening, leading our panel discussion. Our panelists are top notch. Leading the discussion is Otis Taylor Jr. He is our senior editor of Race and Equity. Now, Otis's role at KQED is critical because he works with our journalists as well as our editors to ensure that our coverage or storytelling are culturally competent in how we reflect our diverse communities, how we serve our diverse communities. Otis is a seasoned journalist having worked at San Francisco Chronicle, Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He has deep experience in housing, inequality, policing, and race. He is passionate, committed, and respected. So please join me in welcoming our senior editor of Race and Equity, Otis Taylor, Jr. Good evening. Welcome to our studio audience and welcome to our viewers at home. I want to thank you for joining us. I'd like to set a baseline for tonight's conversation. I shouldn't have to, but let me give you a fair warning. This is a space for real talk. It's a space for real talk that's based in fact. There's no dancing, no hedging, no deflecting. In this space, for the next hour, we're going to confront issues. Racial inequality and wealth disparity in California are inextricably linked to the state's entry to the union. White supremacy was the catalyst for the slaughter, displacement, and imprisonment of indigenous people. White supremacy was the catalyst for the state's refusal to recognize black people as people. Some 170 years since statehood, white supremacy continues to shine bright in the Golden State. Now, before I introduce tonight's panelists, allow me to give you a brief factual history lesson. Gold was discovered in 1848, two years before California was recognized as a slave-free state. Speculators and opportunists, opportunists like uh, Peter Burnett, California's first governor, an enslaver and repugnant racist from Tennessee flooded the state. Burnett tried unsuccessfully to exclude black people from California, but he encouraged the displacement and slaughter of indigenous people. It was an extermination. He also served on the state Supreme Court and was adamant about excluding Chinese people from California. Sidebar, according to a 2020 census, this state is majority people of color. And the margin is getting larger. But all the governors in this state have been white men. Why is that? California's constitution ratified in 1848 said this, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude unless for the punishment of crimes, shall ever be tolerated in this state. Make no mistake, since the state's inception, laws have been enacted to purposely disenfranchise non-white people. At the state's inaugural Constitution Convention, the great O.M. Wozencraft, a delegate from Stockton, had this to say while advocating to exclude black people from entering a supposedly free state. He said, it would appear that the all-wise creator has created the Negro to serve the white race. We see evidence of this wherever they are brought in contact. We see the instinctive 
feeling of the Negro is obedience to the white man. And in all instances, he obeys him and is ruled by him. Do you think an expectation of docility remains? Just last week, I edited a story by my colleague, Suki Lewis, who, drawing from records released because of an expanded police transparency law, a law police unions fought, she reported on an on-duty on police officer who casually used the N-word in front of his supervisor, in front of a police trainee, in front of someone running for city council. Here's what he said. When I get closer to retirement and someone says something about the cops shooting black people, I'm going to say I've never shot an N-word. Hard R. In 1850, the federal government passed the Fugitive Slave Act, which essentially entitled white people the right to re-enslave people who escaped captivity and settled in free states, like California. In 1852, California said, hold my beer, and passed its own Fugitive Slave Act, which legalized the arrest and removal of black people, whether they were the property of a white man or not. Think about it. That's the very definition of state-sanctioned violence. And it continues today with police killings. According to the Washington Post, Black Americans are twice, twice, they are killed at twice the rate of white Americans. This is but one reason why California's Reparation Task Force, the first statewide body to study reparations, is so important. The road to racial equity in this country starts in California. At KQED, we're devoting resources to covering the task force, because it's our belief that our shared history, the stories that bind us all together, must actually reflect the reality of that shared history. In her riveting introduction to our FAQ, which you can find at kqed.org slash reparations, my colleague Lakshmi Sarah wrote, our coverage of the Reparations Task Force is for anyone who wonders about the big questions like, why is there a disproportionate number of unhoused black people? Why are the incarceration rates highest for black people? Why do black communities lack what's easily accessible in white communities? You know, like grocery stores, libraries, restaurants, Shit, banks? Basic investments are missing in black communities. Many of those communities were formed because of discriminatory redlining policies. Why is it that black people are displaced? And when the investment comes, why is it that black people are displaced? We can't appropriate appropriately respond to the issues plaguing the Bay Area, gun violence, property theft, homelessness, until we objectively address our shared history. And let me be clear, more poorly trained and heavily armed policemen isn't a solution. I'd like to shout out my colleagues who were instrumental in crafting the tone of the coverage you can read at kqed.org slash reparations. The aforementioned Lakshmi Sarah, Annalise Finney, who deftly reported on Japanese re reparations like a professional, Beth LaBerge, who will be providing visual documentation of our work. Now, let me introduce you to tonight's panelists, some of the smartest people I know. First is Sarah Truhath. She's the vice president of research at PolicyLink, leading the organization's work to produce original research as well as data and policy tools, such as the National Equity Atlas and the Bay Area Equity Atlas, that support grassroots partners, boost local campaigns, 
and advance transformative policy wins nationally. Yo, Sarah. Sarah. I can't. <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> um, next is Nikki Jones. She's a professor and H. Michael and Jean Williams Department Chair of African American Studies uh, at UC Berkeley. Jones earned her PhD in criminology and sociology from the University of Pennsylvania and is considered a leading expert on race and criminal legal system, policing and violence. Jones is at work on a new book, Brutal and Routine, which draws on 20 years of research to crystallize and provide a necessary understanding of the violence of policing with a reasoned argument for abolition. It will be published by W.W. Norton Press. Nikki, what's up? Y'all, she dropped a, a velvet jacket on us today. <laughs> it's full so fly. Thank you. Um, last is one of my favorite columnists, Erica Smith. She writes for the Los Angeles Times, and her coverage area is diversity of people and places across California. She joined the Times in 2018 as an assistant editor and helped expand coverage of the state's housing and homelessness crisis. She previously worked for the Sacramento Bee, where she was a columnist and editorial board member, covering housing, homelessness, and social justice issues. Before the Bee, Smith wrote for the Indianapolis Star and Akron Beacon Journal. She is a recipient of the Sigma Delta Chi Award for Column Writing and a graduate of Ohio University. Erica, what's up? I was going to say something about the glass office, but <laughs> I, I rejected that. <laughs> yes, indeed. So we're here to talk about California's nine-member reparations task force. And it was formed to study reparations for African Americans and to recommend appropriate ways to educate the California public of the task force findings and to recommend appropriate remedies in consideration of the task force findings. It's important that we are talking about reparations now. Less than two years since the world watched a police officer kneel on a black man's neck for nine minutes while ignoring his pleas for help. But it's also been 31 years since the first video of state-sanctioned violence, a brutal beating by Los Angeles police officers went viral. And if you don't know those names, that's part of why we're here. What are we talking about when we're discussing reparations? Now, I'd like to hear from each of you, but Nikki, why don't you start? When we hear the word reparations and when we think about this task force, what are we really talking about? Yeah, well, thank you uh, first for having me. And it's a real honor to, to be on the stage with all of you and to see all of you folks uh, in the audience and those who are joining us uh, online. Uh, you know, when thinking about this question, you know, I thought to myself, there's never been a moment uh, in my life where black people have not been talking about reparations, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think that's probably true for a lot of black people. And so what are the, you know, the question is, you know, what does it mean in, in this iteration of our conversation about reparations, right? And, and, and part of the reason we're having this conversation is we can think back to the work of, of ta, -Ta Hasi Coates and his, his article, uh, making a case for reparations. And what he's writing about there is this kind of need for a spiritual awakening, right? A kind of rising of the consciousness of Americans uh, to the, the, the original sin and the violence and the state violence that's been done uh, as a consequence of it and providing really concrete examples of the harm that was done uh, so that we can imagine what the, the, the reparation, what the, the redress would be. 
and that was a much different moment, right? We had our first black president. It was before the rise of, of Black Lives Matter, which is uh, and the movement for black lives and the uprisings against systemic racism and police violence uh, that have gotten us to the moment that, that we're in now. Um, and, and, and I'm skipping over that, that presidency that we had as well, but was very consequential <laughs> for, right, uh, the, facts. Yeah, the fact, you know, for, for uh, how we're thinking about all of this now. Uh, and so I think what we have today as a part, as a, as a, as a function of this conversation is in some ways the most sophisticated, um, uh, conversation around what reparations can be. Mm. And so we think of, um, for example, the work of Sandy Darity and thinking about reparations as the acknowledgement of a harm, a system of redress, and then some closure. Uh, you could think about the different layers of, of, of institutions, state in, uh, institutions, uh, local institutions, the federal government, private institutions, that would all be a part of, of, of the response. And the real challenge is going to be, well, how do we do this thing? Yeah. Right. Uh, but when I think about that question for so long, that question was the ending point. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't do that. And this is a conversation I've had with my students in, in class for the, as long as I've been teaching. Right. And you hear that. Well, we can't do that. How are we going to get money to everybody and the, to all these all these people? Right. Well, now we know that we can get money to people really quickly. Yes. Right? yes as a consequence of, of this, this great crisis. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so now I see this as a as a starting point, a question as questions that used to shut down the conversation are now starting points. And so what is reparations? It's both an opportunity mm -hmm. right, to enter into this this conversation. And I think it has to be a conversation. And that is the utility of any task force, because it forces those conversations and it provides the, the documentation of the conversation so that so that all of that is entered into the historical record. Mm -hmm. And so whether or not it happens now in this moment, it is a new starting point. OK. Erica. You know, it's interesting. I've been thinking about this question just as a journalist and covering some of these issues. And, and to Nikki's point, I do think a lot of this has been, you know, people have been talking about this forever, 40 acres and a mule, whatever yes. we should get back, you know. But I think until fairly recently among the general public, it's been in kind of thought of as almost like a fantasy, like if we could do this or if we could do that. Um, and I think that when it became more real, and I would say, you know, obviously post-Trump, you know, post George Floyd, um, and people started to think about this realistically, I think, you know, people didn't really know what to make of it. Is it a cash payment along the lines of what we saw with the stimulus checks? Is it, you know, literally land like 40 acres and a mule? Yes. Is it, you know, is it uh, more of a policy thing? And I think that, you know, as these conversations have started to happen and continue to happen over the last, in earnest, over the last two to three years, I think the conversation has become more sophisticated. And I would say even my thinking about it has become, just from the first column I wrote about it to, to now, what that actually could look like. And I think, well, maybe where people did think it was just strictly cash payments, I think people's imaginations about what reparations could be um, has really changed. And I think some of that, you know, came about as... Um, result of what happened in L.A. County where there was a piece of property, beachfront property, that was mm -hmm. taken by eminent domain by the city of Manhattan Beach a uh, century or so ago or more and was given back uh, to, by the state to the family. And that was such a big defining, to me in my brain, you know, of what reparations could be. It's not just, mm -hmm. you know, give you a check, but, you know, what is this idea of generational wealth, um, you know, land, what are we actually missing? And I think that that mm. concept for me and I think for a lot of people has changed into what is possible. And I, I think it's still kind of a very undefined thing for a lot of people, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's just kind of this question is ongoing. Mm -hmm. Sarah, uh, from a policy perspective, y'all, Sarah has put me up on so much data. <laughs> <laughs> from a policy perspective, what does it mean to you? I mean, I think that it is what was already said in terms of a formal, a formal process of acknowledging the harm and apologizing, right? That has to happen. You have to have a reckoning, which the task force is doing in terms of what is the history? What have we done in California? You have to have redress that is compensation, right? And then you have to have some form of um, reconciliation or healing, right? The coming together closure that you mentioned. Um, so all of those pieces, I think the, po the policy piece is what is the set 
of policies that could start to address the disparities that we see among black Californians. And that, I think, is going to be incredibly generative from this task force to look mm. at the harms and then what is the redress or policy to um, begin to repair those harms. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say when I agree with the uh, increased energy around reparations, mm -hmm. coming to it from an equity perspective at PolicyLink, our focus is racial equity. We haven't had a reparations agenda. Mm -hmm. We are talking about it now. We are hosting an organization Liberation Ventures, which is working on reparations. Um, but it is relatively new to us, but it's an interesting intersection of how the equity movement yes. and this conversation around reparations, which is really acknowledging the need to compensate for past harm, are starting to come together. So I think that's really exciting. I, I do too, and I, I feel um, that this task force, you know, I, I've said it's, this is our Kerner Commission. And if you aren't familiar with the Kerner Commission, um, here's a brief synopsis. Uh, 55 years ago, in the wake of nationwide protests, very much like what we saw in 2020, um, this commission was appointed to investigate the racial uprisings that swept the country. Like, why is this happening? Um, this, the commission found um, that state and federal government housing, education, and social policies, police brutality, and the lack of opportunity among many, many other issues responsible for the racial unrest. The commission concluded, white institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society contones it. Yet we seem to be stuck in the same place. Erica, do you think this task force could provide a roadmap to honest conversation about race and racial inequities in this country? Well, the optimist in me thinks yes, would like to think yes. Um, I, I think it's possible. I mean, from watching a lot of the task force meetings that have been going on for several months now, I think that they are really, you know, scraping all of the things that are wrong. I mean, from housing and gentrification to um, wealth generation, to uh, racial wealth gap to, I mean, you name it, 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 the various different reasons why why black Americans are so far behind other races and, and the reasons why, historical reasons why. I think the thing that worries me a bit is that, you know, a lot of these conversations seem to be kind of just the people who are paying attention are the people who already kind of know. They're the people who are the academics, they're the journalists, they're the people who already have this interest in it, who already understand in some ways, you know, systemic racism. They understand the historical reasons behind, you know, why we are the way we are. But I think to get that honest conversation to the general public, particularly in California, you're going to have to engage a far broader audience. And I worry that that is not happened yet. I think in the last few meetings that have happened, um, you know, what California is doing with the task force is very much groundbreaking and, and no other state is doing this. And it's starting to get more national attention, not just from, you know, national press, but actual people who are calling in to give public comment mm -hmm. um, is evidenced by some of the comments this morning on the task force. But I do I do worry that, you know, the the people who really need to hear and understand these these conversations. So by the time this gets to the legislature and they talk about actual legislative remedies, policy remedies, that they will understand why they're happening the way they're happening. And I, I do fear that those conversations aren't getting out into the broader public. And so I worry about that. Right. And, and Nikki, we've, you know, had many conversations, um, like how, how did, you know, talking to your students about, you know, yes, this can happen or this can be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and pushing back on, you know, that it can't happen, but these conversations that Erica's talking about, how do we, I mean, even begin to have those conversations with people in places in California that, you know, don't like people of color, that are racist? How do we even, even broach yeah, that? Yeah, I think, you know, it's certainly people who, who may be stone cold racist. Um, but what I think, you know, Erica's comment brings up as well in your question is that there's also just a general ignorance mm. about the history. Mm. Right? And, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean that in a not knowing. Yes. Right? And so I have the, what I think are the best students out there. I love my students. Uh, and some of them come from what people would describe as the best high schools, and I'm in air quotes, in, in the country, the best training. And they get to my classroom, and they know virtually nothing 
about black history. And that's one of the reasons they're in my classroom because they want to know, okay. right? And so they understand that they've moved through this whole educational system, right? On track to get to an institution of higher education to Berkeley. And they've been able to do that without having to know that history, mm. right? And so that's a comment on our educational system, whether or not we are preparing people yep. to participate in the kinds of conversations, to be the kinds of voters that they need to be, right, in order to move this, this forward. But I do think that you have to first address that, that ignorance and step into it uh, and understand that it's, it's people who are, who are, you know, both willfully and, and, and you know, um, it just kind of socialized into that, right, right? and get them into the conversation, mm -hmm. uh, and that having these kinds of task forces provides the context for that, right, provides an opportunity for that. But we are talking about a, a system, um, you know, that is, is, you know, what is wrong with our education, mm -hmm. right, that gets us to this point where so many folks know so little about something so important. Right, and, and you know, you and Erica both mentioned that, you know, reparations is nothing new, right? We had a congressman, John Conyers, the late John Conyers of Michigan, who introduced H.R. 40, a bill to study repar rep reparations on a national level every year for almost 30 years. The name of the bill is a nod to special field order number 15 an 1865 decree that authorized the distribution of Confederate land in the South to emancipated people. But after the uh, assassination of Abraham Lincoln, uh, President Andrew Johnson, he assumed the presidency. Um, this man was an enslaver. Twelve of the first 18 presidents of this country were enslavers. And he reversed that order. And now there's a disagreement among academics and advocates for reparations about where the focus should be, local, state, or federal. Now, Sarah, that's something that we have talked at length about. Um, how do you think California's effort plays into the you know, national push for reparations? Yeah, um, it's definitely a big subject of debate amongst many of my friends. Um, and others out there in the world. But um, so here's how I think about it. I think first, the federal government of the United States has to commit to reparations mm. for slavery. Mm -hmm. it, that has to happen. It is so long overdue. Mm -hmm. Black Americans are the only group mm -hmm. that has experienced state-sanctioned state discrimination, but not um, legal discrimination and not received um, uh, reparations. Mm -hmm. So that must happen. Um, there is no substitute for that. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, what will happen in the South, right? So, it, it, you know, there, there's nothing that can happen at that scale that is not at the federal level right. because California is having this task force, right? And New York is talking about having a task force, but is this conversation happening in Mississippi and Alabama? And where do most of black Americans live? In the South, mm -hmm. right? So without a federal policy, it will be um, exclusive, right? It won't reach people. Um, but third, mm -hmm. I do think that the local and state uh, uh, reparations conversations are really generative and important. I think that in the United States, a lot of policy, especially big policy like this, things that we don't understand exactly how to do, there, is, there isn't a roadmap map yet. It can start at the local level and doing pilots to learn, you know, what are the remedies? What does it look like in different mm. places, right? Because the local conversations are about what were the specific harms in Evanston, Illinois? What were the specific harms in Asheville, right? right. Um, and so we're going to learn a lot from local models and discussions around wow. what does an equitable process look like? Um, what are the list of remedies? Um, how do we implement this in ways that are equitable? And so I think we can learn a lot at the local level, but it, it really isn't a substitute for the federal reparations. So. Right. 
Can I just say one yeah, thing? Um, you know, because the, the the forty acres piece gets us to, to to be thinking about land, and one of the things yes. that we have to acknowledge is that we are on land that was was stolen, right? And that the founders of of the state, mm -hmm. you know, the land didn't belong to them, and and so and, and indigenous uh, people here move through waves of colonization and extermination, mm -hmm. as you said at the top. Uh, and so I think that you know what I see people grappling with in a really serious way. And thinking about you know what that compensation is and the role that land plays when we understand the nation itself is built on a system of, of settler colonialism and, and systemic genocide right. alongside slavery, right? And so reparations is a, is a model for for some compensation and redress, uh, and yet it exists along alongside these the, you know these these other um, you know atrocities in our history that we have to grapple with as well. Right. Um, and when we're talking about this model, Sarah, and, you know, the, the people have experienced or their ancestors have experienced this atrocity. We got to answer the question of who is eligible. Oh, yeah. And this week, the task force, the last two meetings, they were trying to tackle that that question. Erica. Yeah, it's it's honestly the most I mean one of the more fascinating parts of this conversation for me to, to watch as a task force today, um, there was the question of, you know, who's actually eligible for reparations? That's assuming, again, mm -hmm. that all of these other uh, process, you know, things passed the legislature, there's money improved, you know, X, Y, and Z. But, you know, the question is, is it about lineage? Like, who can actually prove that they were right. descendants of slaves? Mm -hmm. um, which is the most um, legally sound way to make it through, muster of the, through the courts. And then there's the question of whether it's, you know, by general race and by harm. Um, so if you, you know, is it a question of you can prove that your ancestors were here and enslaved? Uh, or were, did you move over, did your family come later and just, you know, were they, you know, redlined out of housing? Were they right. other things that happened? And, you know, it's a real question. And I, I think about that for myself. I mean, like, you know, my, my great grandmother, best I can tell, <laughs> was grew up in New Orleans and I've tried to track her history down. And, you know, New Orleans is one of the cities that has, like, some of the oldest records going back. I can't even find, you know, records of that. And I think wow. about the number of people in this country who are, are black, um, who don't know their ancestors, who don't, who are maybe in the foster system, who all these other things that, if all things were perfect, they could find out, you know, that they were and be eligible. Or the people um, who how many people are going to submit their DNA for genealogy testing and who's right. going to pay for that genealogy testing? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many questions about this. Um, and, you know, personally, I worry about this, and this came up during the task force meeting today, was this idea of, like, are we going to do a new litmus test for who's black? Like, who's black yes. enough? Are you, are you really black or are you really black? Mm -hmm. And, and how does, is it creating this kind of tiered system? And so I think in this quest for reparations, I think it's going to surface a lot of things within our community that maybe wouldn't necessarily be public, maybe shouldn't be public, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's going to show some stuff that some ugliness within our own community mm -hmm. and it's some stuff that we have yet to reckon with. Um, and um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we're really prepared for that, to be honest with you. Um, but it is a question that's going to have to be answered as we move forward in this reparations discussion. And I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about within our community, mm -hmm. how that's going to play out when we get into it, when we have people talking, you know, testifying and, you know, determining what is black, who is black. Yeah. I mean, right now, I mean, Kamala Harris and Barack Obama wouldn't count, yeah. you know, under the lineage, you know, uh, formula. I mean, I don't know if that's fair or not fair, but I, it's, <laughs> it's, it, Brings to light some interesting questions. Mm -hmm. I think I think both of them are, are set. Good point. Good point. They're good. They're good. But you know, this this makes me think though, like you know, so so we we can have a system of reparations that responds to the direct harm that that was done historically, and we also have to account for the active ways in which institutions mm. draw on the logics that allowed for that violence at that time mm. in, in recent history. So, you know, and that's one of the, the challenges at the end of slavery, the logics that justified slavery remain, right? Uh, and then they, they justify patterns of, of racial exclusion throughout history and racial violence, including state violence. And yes. so part of it is, is you know, who is, is eligible, uh, but then who is responsible for the violence being done and what, how do we know? And there, there, there are some records 
very clear records, yes. right, of, of towns being devastated, mm -hmm. right, of people being lynched. Mm -hmm. um, we have some very clear records of that. And we have records of harm done in the present moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so thinking about the institutions doing that harm and how are they held accountable for that. Right. And I want to talk about harm now. Um, season two of uh, Sold Out, that's our housing podcast, um, it just dropped. And this season looks at evictions in the Bay Area, where despite local and state moratoriums, people were still being evicted. Uh, I, I think you can guess who was being evicted most. Uh, the city with the highest rate was Antioch, which is 54% um, black and brown, according to census data. Um, black people are disproportionately renters in this state. And it's black people, particularly black women, who are more likely to be evicted than white renters. Sarah, you shared with me some startling data that, um, that I'd like to share with the audience. Um, it, according to 2019 data, 35% of black Californians are homeowners. And that's a decline from 39% in 2000. Uh, black people have the lowest homeownership rate across all racial and ethnic groups in the state. Comparatively, white home homeownership in 2019 was 63%, a decrease of two percentage points over um, two decades. How much trouble are we in, Sarah? Uh, people can't afford to live here in the Bay Area and California, and it's disproportionately impacting black women. Yeah, absolutely. Um, black women with children, especially, right, um, in terms of who's most likely to be evicted. Yeah, it is. I think housing is a central point of focus for this conversation around reparations and equity more broadly, mm -hmm. and especially in California, because we have such high housing costs mm -hmm. and the trends, like you said, um, declining home ownership rates for black American, black Californians, sorry. Um, and housing is such a central platform for your health, your well-being, your economic opportunities, mm -hmm. um, wealth, you know, for black people in general, not just in California, uh, wealth is more likely to be held in your house. But yet the foreclosure crisis really started yes. to decimate that, right? So. That's the situation we're in. And so the rentership rates, right? Um, is, so we know that most black Californians are renters. So the renter agenda is really, really critical to get right in terms of having, um, you know, changing these statistics because the uh, black Californians also pay the most unaffordable rent. Mm. So they're the most rent burdened. And we did this analysis and we looked at, okay, so if you didn't have rent burden, rent and burden means you pay more than 30% of your income mm -hmm. on housing. If you took that away for black Californians, they would have $7,000 per year more. Mm -hmm. I mean, this huge increase in disposable income to spend on other family needs, right? Education, transportation, childcare. Mm -hmm. So it is a huge issue to tackle. It's really important right now. The, the sold out podcast you're referencing, you know, we are in the middle of trying to get renters uh, back rent. Right. 700,000 people in this state. Yeah. So it's and it's of course, it's disproportionately black renters, um, not exclusively, but disproportionately. And so people are right now we're looking at the data right now from the state program. It'll come out next week and people are waiting. You know, people are waiting in that pipeline to get assistance mm -hmm. um, for uh, an average of 130 days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so it's really critical. And it's urgent right now. So part of the long term reparations agenda for sure. And, and so urgent right now, mm -hmm. you know, Erica. And I'm, I'm just wondering if people see this because in 2020, voters resoundingly rejected affirmative action. Um, when the task force recommends re reparations next summer, which in whatever form, um, will the response by our elected officials and the electorate be a test for liberalism in California? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not a. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki. <laughs> 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 
Well, you know, I'm not originally from California, but my impression since living here is people are liberal until it's inconvenient. Mm. And I feel like that mm, is kind of in said. part yes. of what is behind the vote of affirmative action. And I think that, you know, in 2020, you know, coming out of the Trump years, I think there was this kind of righteous, you know, liberalism in California. Like, we are not, well, in liberal California anyway, but <laughs> we are not, you know, right wing. We are not Trump supporters. We are, you know, we stand for science and for equity and for, you know, you name it. And I think that, you know, Americans and Californians, we have short attention spans. And I think that, mm. I think we've seen that. And, you know, the moment, you know, as we started to, I guess, in theory, come out of the pandemic, um, when you know the social costs of the pandemic started to become clear, right. um, all of the people who had were on the, who were housing insecure, who had lost their housing, who had become homeless, who had lost their jobs, who um, had their wages cut, whose you know kids were out of school for longer than they anticipated, whose families were you know beset by illness and death, and mm. all of these social ills that come along with that. And crimes died, started to spike you know, in Oakland, in parts of South LA, um, in all of our urban communities, you know, people who were, you know, frankly, the white people in parts of the wealthier parts of our communities who were, you know, six months ago all for equity and doing right. all these things were suddenly like, oh my God, we need to put more police on the streets. Oh my mm -hmm. God, we need, you know, and that's what you see in the polls right now. And it's very much a, you know, a 180, mm -hmm. a lot of it. I mean, we just did a poll, LA Times of, in LA County, just looking at, um, the number of people who want to see more police and want more in reinvestment. Um, we have a mayoral, mayoral race happening right now. Um, Karen Bass, Congress, Karen Bass is one of our leading candidates who historically has been one of the more liberal members of Congress and, and in the state legislature before that. She was one of the, you know, the authors of the George Floyd and policing bill. She's been pushing that, but even she has talked about increasing the size of LAPD mm -hmm. um, and talking about, can, you know, adhering to the polls and adhering to where the public is. And so for me, when I think about what the task force is getting ready to, you know, drop this proposal in a few months, where are the politics going to be? They're going to be even more right than they are now is the way that I see it going. And so I worry that that window that we had that frankly allowed, mm. you know, then, you know, member of legislature Weber, now Secretary of State Shirley Weber, right. to pass this bill right. and to get this kind of applause for doing it, that moment is kind of not passed, but is like it's a window that's shrinking. <clears throat> so I don't know where the legislature that's so far, that says they're so liberal, says they're so Democrat, where, you know, Governor Newsom is going to be on this stuff. I think it's going to come down to a lot of public pressure. And I don't know. I, the polls are showing way more of this kind of retrenching uh, of stuff that was more of a white supremacist mindset you know, it, it happened has. in San Francisco yeah. where, um, you know, our mayor, uh, Mayor London Breed, instead of, mm -hmm. you know, in the tenderloin where um, disproportionately black men are dying of fent fentanyl overdoses and also um, who are on the streets, you know, the response or the plan is, you know, we need to have more police. You know, we need to occupy the area as if that's going to solve anything. Because it worked so well in the past. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but you know, th you're saying it's going more right. Um, I really believe the critical, you know, the artificial critical race theory argument is going to come to California, particularly if the former president runs. You know, that would be a staple of his stump. Um, and it upended, you know, gubernatorial election in Virginia, um, school boards throughout uh, the South. Um, I believe it will descend on California. Nikki, when we had lunch over the holidays, we talked about, you know, counter narratives to mm -hmm. conventional thought. Mm -hmm. And you're writing a book mm -hmm. <laughs> that's going to argue, you know, for the abolition of police. Mm -hmm. How do we break the dissonance created by the right wing outrage mach machine to reach people? You know, how, you know, what's the pre to that mm -hmm. argument that's going that Eric was talking about where it's, hey, well, let's move right. We need more police. That's the answer. I think the pre is the argument that we've been having um, for decades. I mean, so part of the work that I do and my colleagues do in, in black studies is to constantly produce a counter narrative mm. to these ideologies and beliefs mm -hmm. that justify oppression, exploitation, violence, subjugation, mm -hmm. right? And on and on and on. Uh, and I, you know, what I appreciate about, appreciate about this moment 
is in part because of the, the work that folks have done in, in, in black studies and other folks, critical race scholars, doing this kind of work is that we do have a very large body of evidence uh, at, of the harm and an argument right, to push back against and to, to accurately diagnose what's happening in this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is what we can do for people. That's the kind of work, the, and, and, and the work of, of journalists and, and artists and, and activists do this work as well. It's con I mean, there's never a moment to not be imagining the pre or the retrenchment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, it, so and I think that, that counter narrative in, in that work is there. But I do think it's a danger that, that yes, folks are going to come to California. They're going to come to Berkeley. Yes. They come to my class now. Like 99% yes. of the things I say, I, I can't say in some other state if I'm a K-12 K, K educator, right? And that's, that's an issue. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we do have to be ready. I think we have to, to stay ready uh, for, that, for that to come and to uh, provide people with, you know, to, I don't want to use like violent language and say to, to arm people, right, in this battle, but in many ways it is a battle, right? Mm -hmm. And people do have to have an ability to diagnose what is not original in any stretch of the imagination. Right, right, right. This is not new. Like we knew that this retrenchment was going to come. Mm -hmm. We know that there's going to be some manufactured moral panic, right? None of it is, is original. And so to help people diagnose it, understand it, and act and connect to uh, a, a history of people who have done that mm -hmm. right, over the, the long struggle is part of what we can do, what we can anticipate uh, you know, in, in pushing back against what is likely to come, but what is already here as well. Exactly. Yeah. It's, um, you mentioned that you know, there's all, all this information, but the do your research crowd actually doesn't want to read and doesn't want to actually, <laughs> doesn't actually want to educate itself. Um, Sarah, this is something I've always wanted to ask you is that, you know, you can go, just Google Bay Area Equity Atlas. You can go and find out so much data about the place we live. You can find, you know, we say racial disparities, we say inequities, but you can go and see in a granular detail um, what's happening here. Is it frustrating to do that research and you know present this data and you know people it needs to reach you know to understand to you know I'm thinking legislators to um, people who are skeptical of this Black Lives Matter movement. Is it frustrating that people aren't? inquisitive to learn more or to dive into that data that you've just presented, it's for free right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think I've found in our work that the data can actually be really a conversation starter. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've worked across the country and in the Bay Area um, to bring people together around the data and they're not Oftentimes, there are people that are already in the equity movement, but not always. We, we were presenting the data to the Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So it was a budget justice coalition that asked us to share data from the Bay Area Equity Atlas because they were getting curious about equity. So I've found that those tools, when we have the opportunity to share the data and to really look at, okay, what does it look like and what are the drivers? And we start to have these same conversations similar to the rep reparations conversation. What are the structural and systemic drivers mm -hmm. of these disparities that we see? And then what could we do locally? Right. Um, what are the action steps? So yes, I want more people to go to the Bay Area Equity Atlas. And I think that it is a tool that others can use to start having those conversations. I know a lot of students use it, mm -hmm. um, so it, it can really be helpful in the community. More journalists should be using it. Uh, <laughs> one um, data point, I believe it was uh, around representation yeah. that we spoke about earlier this year um, and that I've been researching myself. Um, the Bay Area is 60% people of color. But our elected officials are 60% white. So when we t ask ourselves, why hasn't anything changed? 
Well, I think representation matters, right? Yeah, it, it definitely matters. It's not everything because you can have dem the demographics of electeds could look just like the demographics of the community, but they might not be um, voting for equity focused mm -hmm. policies, right? But it does matter in terms of having lived experience in the communities, especially marginalized uh, communities, excluded communities that haven't been connected, that have no trust mm -hmm. in local government, you know, having representation in the halls of power does matter. It creates those connections. So it matters a lot and we have a long way to go. We're slowly, we've been tracking this data. We gather it every, every year for the past four years and it is getting marginally better. Mm -hmm. It's like this slow crawl to getting a little bit better but still so far still and, still yeah so speaking of representation um i feel there's assault active assaults on voting rights and reproductive rights in this country um there's really an assault on black history well which is really american history um i like to take this moment to recognize a piece of california's black history Shirley Weber, currently the Secretary of State, a black woman, authored the bill signed by Gavin Newsom, which established the task force, which is chaired by Camilla Moore, a black woman. President Joe Biden, I think it should be like in the next couple of days, said by the end of fe February, he was going to nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court. And Leandra Kruger, who sits on California Supreme Court, a black woman, is on the short list. Of course, there were blatantly racist responses from white men, many of whom support the big lie, many of whom supported the former president, who was, I think, the most unqualified person for the job. They were attacking black women. I want to ask you, Erica, Nikki, Sarah, black women have been the backbone of so many movements in this country. But why is it that black women are so readily attacked? You know, saying they have not accomplished enough, saying that they haven't done enough. Why do you think that is? <laughs> I tackling this one first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've given, definitely given it some thought. I mean, you know, by no means am I in the kind of public eye that, you know, Dr. Weber is a secretary of state, but, you know, as a columnist, I get my fair share of arrows sent my way um, that are, I've noticed are very different than my male colleagues and, and even female colleagues of different races. Um, I don't know. I think in some ways, I think because black women have, as you said, been the backbone of so many different movements, I think black women just have a tendency to just tell you exactly what things are without mincing words. I mean, tact isn't always our strong suit. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's actually one of the reasons I appreciate interviewing Dr. Weber. She always gives me a really good quote. Um, yes, indeed. <laughs> but, you know, I think that, you know, that, that uh, habit of getting right to the point and not sugarcoating things and just being very direct, I don't think it sits well with people who are used to having their egos and everything coddled like the number of emails I get from a week from some white man telling me he's been oppressed is like skyrocketing yes. <laughs> and it's you know and it's it's by stuff that they, they don't understand the definition of oppression and that you know I think that as our society becomes more is in theory more equal um and these issues that we've been talking about become more relevant and more and clearer and more people understand the history and the, the reality, you know, and, and black women just don't shut up. I think people just don't like people who just don't shut up and tell the truth. Mm. And black women have the habit of don't, not saying, <laughs> they won't shut up. So that's my theory anyway. Uh, what do you think, uh, Nikki? I agree with uh, all of that. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, I think fundamentally a black woman in that position, a black woman on the Supreme Court, a black woman president, 
is a threat to the society that they imagine belongs to them, mm -hmm. mm. Mm. that they are entitled mm -hmm. to, yep. mm. right? And so if we go from Du Bois to the Kambahi River Collective, thinking of the role of, of queer black women in, in fighting against systemic uh, racism and police violence, right? We know if, if, if black women can be free, then we're all free. But some people don't want all of us to be free, right. didn't want it then and mm -hmm. don't want it now. Mm -hmm. right? and, and that is, I think, part of the reaction, the kind of deep psychic reaction mm -hmm. that you are getting. And, and that, yes, we know, We've, we experienced it on the street, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, and, and so it is part of the, the interactional experience, but also part of the institutional mm -hmm. experience in, in, that, in that kind of psychic violence that is, they imagine being done to them by a, a, having a black woman uh, in that place. So, there, I mean, there's a lot to, to say about that. Um, and at the same time, if we can imagine that this happens, that a black woman is on the Supreme Court and like, you know, in parens, not all black women are the same, <laughs> right? Uh, and so we got to do some like serious vetting when it comes to the, the black woman who's, uh, but to have a black woman on the Supreme Court Mm -hmm. when we understand that there was a time in our country's history where black women had no rights before any court. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Reproductive or otherwise. Right. That is, is, is of, of symbolic significance. And I think because of that history, that is why it's seen as such a threat. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, you know, we've talked about, um, you know, basically white allyship mm. and, you know, being able to, speak, you know, to the power and, you know, not running from when, when, you know, when it becomes difficult, when liberalism becomes difficult. Um, talk about that allyship and needing that um, to support black women, but also to support um, this idea that, hey, we as a society, society need to do something or this is going to continue. It's going to continue. These problems are going to continue. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, personally, I come to it from a social justice, racial justice perspective, right? Like, that's my point of view, and I care about repair. And, um, but, you know, it really is everyone's issue, right? Right. So, what, I mean, one, we need to win the transformative policies that we need. We need white people to vote for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, need, we need white people to care. We need brown people to care. I mean, so it, we need to build a bigger coalition. Um, and I think it really is about building a multiracial democracy. It is our project in America. Mm -hmm. I, racism costs all of us, right? System systemic racism and inequities are this huge burden and cost that we feel in so many different ways. And if we can work to solve those, I do think that everyone will benefit. You know, we have a framing that we use at PolicyLink, equity is the superior growth model. And mm. we talk about how um, if you focus on addressing those systemic inequities, remedying them, then like there are going to be cascading benefits um, for everyone. And we've actually even calculated it in terms of in the United States, if you didn't have inequity, racial inequities in income, it would be two trillion more in GDP. The economy would grow wow. if you didn't have those barriers, those exclusions, right? So that would mean more small businesses, more thriving communities. So um, there's a de democratic case, a democracy case for it. There's an economic case mm. in addition to the moral case. And I think talking about that more could bring in more people into the conversation because we do need white folks to also be for reparations, right? Yeah, I mean, we need the legislature, which is majority yeah. white, to in a majority people of color state. So we need we need the votes. Um, or we could change the legislature. We should. Change the <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, but we need money to do that. And That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, okay. I am ready for some questions. Are y'all ready for yeah, some sure. questions? Let's do it. Yes, let's, um, let's do a Q&A right now and let's talk to the people, which is what it's all about. Yeah, then there was light. Oh, you have the mic? I mean, I'm, I can call on people. I'm good with that. <laughs> Got a question. Awesome. 
Let me uncall you. Hi, thanks for sharing space tonight. Um, so one thing that I've been seeing in the task force meetings is that there's this idea that the longer we wait to pay out reparations, the bigger the bill gets. Mm. And I'm just wondering what your what your all's thoughts on that is. Mm. <laughs> uh, well, factually, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's and it's already in the billions and trillions. Uh, and so, you know, I think that there are a number of reasons not to wait. Um, I think that there are descendants now who do know um, their histories and, and linkages and um, are deserving of compensation. I also think that there, you know, and I was thinking as Sarah was talking about the, the rent issue. So we're talking about reparations in the context of ongoing exploitation and state violence. Mm -hmm. And if you can continue to do that and never be held account, then you'll continue to do that. So symbolically, one of the things that the reparations task force can do in a system of reparations can encourage, and again, like we're in a, a kind of a global capitalist context, right? But can encourage institutions to, change, to, to act differently, to change their behavior. And it's going to need a, like a lot of force and pressure to do that, right? But what does reparations mean in a context of this ongoing exploitation. So take housing, for example, when it, things are looking really bad, right? Terrible. Once the, the, you know, once we get to this moment where rents are due, we know exactly who that's going to impact the most. And we also know that there are real estate investment trusts and corporations that are buying up houses uh, in East Oakland, right? And, and other parts of the Bay Area. What if those, those, those places are land trusts and some of that exists in the Bay Area as well? And that land, right, and again, we still have the issues around land, but that land is then, then passed on, right, to those people who right now are at risk of economic catastrophe, right? So, so there is, I think, an urgency to it um, for a number of, of different reasons. Um, and just, yeah, factually, it, the bill is going to con continue to get higher, um, yet it's already astro astronomical. Right? Yeah, I think uh, um, Sandy Darity and um, mm -hmm. he's put it at between twelve and fourteen trillion dollars mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the bill. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I'm thinking about money when um, if you get evicted, like it's it's so hard to get another apartment. It's right. devastating. And then if you if you can't pay your rent, you get evicted. Then how are you going to have? The first month's deposit, the la you know, first and last month's deposit, the money to move your stuff to another place. I mean, and then there's just the time to search for a place, and you're probably working. I mean, it is, it's so stressful. I can't, I can't imagine how, how stressful that is. Yeah, I mean, there's also, like, you know, the perverse incentive, too. I mean, I agree, the longer you wait, the bigger the bill gets, but the other reality is, is that, you know, black folks are moving out of California, mm. you know, because they can't afford to live here. So there also is the perverse incentive that the longer you wait, the fewer people you have to potentially pay for. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, politically speaking, and that's just the, the cynical journalist in me that looks <laughs> at the flip side. But, I mean, I don't know. I think that, yes, the moral right thing to do would be to pay up now and to, to, to move this. But, you know, I... I think there's different ways of looking at this in the in the the shrewd political sense of the word, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily put anything past mm -hmm. you know some of our lawmakers to go that route either. So, and I you know I do want to bring in the role of universities uh, mm -hmm. as well, uh, and I think that one of the things that we've seen happen across the countries is, country is that universities have taken a really active role in examining their own history and relationship to slavery, and some places are developing, you know, programs and, and, and reparations for that in really kind of specific and detailed ways. Um, but again, if we think about the, the present harm, we could think about universities um, developing uh, programs for black students. Now, very difficult, uh, you know, <laughs> you're <laughs> covering politics, okay. very difficult to get that kind of thing, right, support for that kind of thing. Um, but to think about not only residents in California right now, but people who might come to California who are black uh, and because of their connection to that history are owed something, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, and our state institutions owe them, owe them something, right? Yeah. So it's an opportunity for growth for California in, in a lot of ways. Um, so mm -hmm. it's in that model, mm -hmm. sure. So got another question, an audience. 
Um, I have a, a statement um, and a question. Um, I am a single black mother who put, single-handedly put my daughter through college and in the process losing my home because I took out a mortgage to put her through because I made too much to get mm -hmm. assistance to mm -hmm. pay for her to go to college. So I'm not this deadbeat black person that could not pay her way. I needed a little help, mm -hmm. but in those the predatory lending, mm -hmm. I lost everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Having said that, I believe in the talks of reparation, there needs to be more repair, mm -hmm. as Sarah was saying. Mm -hmm. And repair to me is something like land, mm -hmm. opportunities, mm -hmm. not just a check mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. possibly um, some won't use it to better themselves or their, mm -hmm. their children. Mm -hmm. um, where in the way of land, uh, education, uh, grants, and things of that mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, I always say when they have these commissions or these task force, they never ask people who are impacted and affected by whatever the, the issue is what their thoughts are. Um, and I would like to see that because whatever it is they're talking about, I guarantee you, they don't know how to really help people mm -hmm. that, that are actually being impacted, and I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've worked for the federal government for 30 years. Mm -hmm. I experience racism um, in ways that, you know, people treat you differently or feel that, you know, this opportunity should go to this person first because they're less vocal, whatever. I'm, I was never a disrespectful person. I was a union person, union rep, mm -hmm. but you get treated differently. Mm -hmm. you, you get punished more severely mm -hmm. than somebody who is of another skin color. Mm -hmm. so, so I internalized that and over time it did break me down mm -hmm. to, to the point where you know, I have high anxieties and things like that. But people don't understand that. Mm. They don't have that experience, okay? And I was a professional worker, wasn't uh, a, a laborer or anything like that. I worked with people, I, I did the job of people who had JDs, you know, mm. attorney, you know, uh, law degrees and stuff like that. So I, I just, in, in saying all of this, Repair is what's needed, and that's a better solution than just saying across the board, give everybody a check. I would like to see more opportunities created mm -hmm. um, for housing, home ownership. That's what the help should be. Mm -hmm. so, so, but the question is, is are they going to ask people who are directly impacted um, what repair should look like? Yes, they are, and um, I, I bet they'd like to hear your story, too. Yeah. Um, the task force is modeling, um, uh, I call it a tour, um, around across the state to hear from black people, to, to um, get their stories so it becomes like they can archive their stories and becomes part of the narrative of, uh, you know, I've always been in, of the opinion that, you know, you, if you go to communities, ask people what mm -hmm. they need, yeah. they will tell you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what the task force is doing, much like what um, uh, a commission did uh, for Japanese reparations, where they went to cities, including San Francisco, um, and uh, captured testimony from people who were imprisoned um, by, by this country. But, um, how important do you think the stories are to, to capture those? Yeah, I just want to acknowledge mm -hmm. you and, and thank you for sharing your story and to tell you that um, when we think about the impact of the Great Recession and, and, and Sarah may have you know, more you know, of the data to, to share with you on the, <laughs> yes, but does. the impact on, on the, great, uh, the Great Recession and the predatory housing loan right, catastrophe conspiracy mm. fell very hard on the backs of black women. If you look in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. I think you see that. And you see exactly, I'm sure that you were the woman in your family that everyone came to, right, when they needed something, right? You were the one who had a good job, right, with the federal government, and you were a target by, by predatory loans. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Right. Right? right. In this moment. So what is what is the repair for that? And it, that was the case because you're black. Thanks. Whether or not <laughs> you uh, you know your exact linkage to slavery, right? And you may, but I'm just saying whether or not because you are black in this moment, what it means to be black in the settings in which you were in, right? That made you a target. And so there has to be some acknowledgement of that and exactly what you're laying out are possible solutions. So maybe it's a trust, maybe it's an educational trust, maybe it's a housing trust, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so that you can imagine other kinds of, of ways to access um, the, what you need to build wealth, but also to repair repair the harm that was done to you. And that is where you can, you can hold you know, we, we, the uh, institutions accountable yes. right, for repairing that harm. Corporations. Corporations. I have not lived that down. That's, that's still harming yeah. everybody. Yes. I can't even drive down the street without. Yes. And it's you and it's so many black women yeah. who, were, who were striving, right, who were doing the thing for their families who became the targets. And then what you're, the other part of what you're saying is the weathering effect. Right. And so the health consequences mm -hmm. right, of moving through the, the, your career as a black woman in this setting right, uh, and the treatment that you received, that it does have a health consequence, both on our mental health and our physical health. And we see that in health disparities. And then who's who's accountable for that? Mm -hmm. Right. Because then you go to the doctor, you go to the, the hospital. Right. And all these beliefs about black people are informing how you're being treated there, too. Yes. Yes. Right. So every institution has a price to pay. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and, and the stories, you know, as, a, as an ethnographer, I think the stories are, are central to that. Yes. Indeed. And I will add that, you know, the, the task force is taking public comment if it matters before each meeting. Like there's an hour, I think, before before they actually talk. And you can also submit a comment online as well. So, I mean, it, it gets a lot. I mean, I do think it actually is informing what they're doing, if it, it helps at all. And I would encourage you to definitely share your story as much as possible. And I, and to Otis's point, I do, I do know that they are traveling the state. So I do get the sense I do actually care <laughs> what people actually think. Um, so if, that, if that's at all helpful to you. But thank you for sharing your story. Yes. And I would say the expectation that they weren't reaching out is the right one to have, given the behavior of most political bodies, exactly. right? So that, I mean, it's also, a huge exactly. thing. We have a report coming out about the task forces that were set up. I mean, it's not about reparations, but the task forces mm -hmm. that were set up right um, at the beginning of COVID, the pandemic task oh, forces, yeah. and okay. how <laughs> it's all business representatives, yeah. like extremely oh. few yes. labor community representatives um, at all. So that is the normal way of operating. So it's a, the correct assumption, and it sounds like the, this task force is doing better. But that's always um, a really important demand to be making that impacted people are at the table because mm -hmm. it's not, you cannot assume that will happen. Exactly. For sure. So um, California's history is, is under a microscope right now. Um, as the first statewide task force in the nation to study reparations for black people combs through this state's unpleasant beginning and ramifications that we see today chattel slavery, the enslavement and ownership of people and their descendants is a unique terror in this country's history. KQED's coverage of reparations and the Reparations Task Force is an invitation to think about our shared history. Um, I want you to ask yourself, instead of appreciating and approaching race and equity as complex issues who benefits when we pretend that racism doesn't exist? Find us at kqed.org slash reparations. And um, let's hear it for our panelists tonight. I think that's it. That's our cues. I want that jacket for real. <laughs> Velvet. Thank you all. Um, we'll see you.